jet airliner takes off. It's a sight we accept as commonplace. This one is Britain's latest, the Trident. The birds can do the trick too, but they have their own motor inside them and don't rely on jets. Since the beginning of time, men have envied the birds and have tried, often with fatal results, to imitate them. This French Marquis floundered down into the River Seine in 1742, breaking only his leg. He was lucky. Many people heard reports that a certain Herr Dagen, a Swiss clockmaker, had actually succeeded in flying from 1809 onwards. What the reports didn't say, however, was that most of Dagen's weight was conveniently lifted by a balloon. The British pioneer, Sir George Cayley, in the middle of last century, made a triplane glider and designed some side flappers to propel it. But although it flew as a glider, it was the same story, the same old trouble. Man's own engine wasn't powerful enough. But the mesmeric influence of the bird persisted. Man continued to flap on, but not off. Inventors just wouldn't give up. They made their mounts lighter and lighter to give them more of a chance. Their hopes rose ever higher as they urged their machines forward. Then both hopes and machine collapsed together. It's hard to imagine what the birds thought of this energetic imitator, who, like all his friends, remained firmly on the ground. Another valiant effort, this time resembling a Venetian blind. But like its namesake, it folds up. The French cyclist Poulain tries an ingenious winged cycle to see how far he can air jump. Then a more earthbound mortal gate crashes the party. Meanwhile, the birds ply their craft gracefully and without effort. They swim in the air easier than a man can swim in water. Man can also fly gracefully after 60 years practice, but in machines. And he makes a lot of noise and uses a lot of someone else's power in the process. He can even land gracefully too, but has to take a lot of care in putting his mechanical bird back on the earth. The infinite massing of skills necessary to build and fly these giants has also produced ever lighter and stronger materials to build from. And the men who built the Trident decided they could also have a go at building a man-powered but fixed wing bird. Why? Because no one had done it before. And there was a challenge to meet and a prize to win in a competition administered by the Royal Aeronautical Society and sparked off by industrialist Henry Kramer who put up the prize money. This is the result, and the team who built her call her the Puffin. The very latest knowledge, the highest skills and the lightest materials have gone into this man-bird. The wings and fuselage are built of spruce and balsa and are covered with the sort of plastic people wrap their sandwiches in. This is no amateur job. These men are highly skilled professionals and as much care and thought is being lavished on this frail craft as goes into the modern jetliner. The tests are just as rigorous. Every part of the plane has got to be put through its paces and proved to be perfect for the job. Will those wings support the weight of man and bird? The puffin is driven by pedal and propeller. Here's how the transmission was developed and how they found out how much effort would be needed and who could keep it up. Here's the human engine, a cyclist with a difference. They call this craft the puffin, not only because of its deep chested look, but because of the puffin and blowing that's got to go into the flying.
The main secret is in the wings and how the air will flow over them and sustain the delicate and narrow cambered surfaces which stretch out for 84 feet to give maximum lift combined with minimum resistance. The whole puffin is a miracle of lightness and strength. It weighs just 118 pounds without the pilot, the weight of an average girlfriend. And what the ancients hoped for in vain, the moderns are now determined to achieve. At last, this beautifully tailored little machine is ready for final checks. Every inch of her has been gone over. All this work has been done by her designers in their spare time, and Puffin has been built by the instructors and students of the de Havilland Aeronautical Technical School. About 50 men have helped in this triumph of teamwork. The puffin is rolled out by its proud and confident creators, just as they rolled out the trident some months earlier. This is the moment. Is man at last going to lift his own weight off the ground by his own muscular power? The pilot fits himself in carefully among the forest of bars and cables and settles himself in position. The nose is carefully fitted over the pilot and his saddle, streamlining the man and his mechanism. He's ready to go. Geared high to turn the propeller, the cycle pedals move slowly round. The puffin begins to move. The pilot puts on power steadily. Manpower, muscle power. The puffin gathers speed. The wings begin to take the weight of puffin and man. Now she's off the ground. And she stays up, airborne above the tarmac. Now she rises. She's being driven steadily through the air. Steady, man-powered flight is being achieved for longer than ever before. John Wimpany, the first man to pedal a plane through the air for more than half a mile, joins the select company of Icarus and the Wright brothers, the leader of a team of British pioneers. And what's the practical result of this achievement? It's the profound satisfaction of solving a problem, of chalking up another first in man's conquest of the air. <laughs>